Hey, everybody. I'm Chris. Hey, I'm Bill. Have you ever asked yourself, what is your superpower? Everyone has a superpower. Most people just don't know what it is. We're going to help you uncover it. This podcast is all about helping people figure out what their truly unique superpower is. Superpowers, what's yours? Hello and welcome to another Superpowers podcast. You know, everyone has strengths, everyone has weaknesses, but uncovering your unique superpower, it's like peeling back the onion to its core. We have a special guest here with us today. We are super excited. Chris, why don't you introduce our guest? We got the rap sheet, everybody. We got Ian Rappaport, NFL Network. The rap sheet is in the house. Um, we are, it's been, uh, it's been a hard time trying to track this man down with, uh, with uh, all, all things NFL and the draft, but we finally got him on the Superpowers podcast show. Ian, welcome. Uh, it's good to be here. I've been, I've been waiting for this moment. It has finally come, thank goodness. Uh, I will also say that uh, if I have to text uh, or take a phone call in the middle of this, I apologize, but only a little bit. Yeah. L- uh, listen, it would be awesome if you actually, because we told Ian if he needs to break, because there's, you know, the NFL schedule is being released today. If he needs to break, we'll edit it. But what he doesn't know is we're not actually editing it. <laughs> so we're going right. to we're gonna, we're actually get breaking news right here on Superpowers Podcast. And, 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 and hopefully he, uh, he, forgets to, uh, he forgets to hit the mute button. Uh, Ian, welcome, um, welcome to the show. So, uh, you know, as Bill uh, already called out, we like to peel back the onion here. We want to learn a little bit about you and your journey. And, and hopefully Bill and I at the end of our show can, can do our best to, to tell you what your superpower is, because I know you've been dying to, to know that answer yourself. So um, we're, we're going we're gonna to start that off. I'm actually going to start a little differently because I'm, I'm curious and I've never asked you before we get into your background, rap sheet, where did it come from? Where, how did, how did that get coined and when and how? So uh, I wish I could take credit for this because uh, it really is like a, it's a great name. I, I love it. And I've, this is my third job at least using this mon- moniker and I will probably use it for the rest of my life. Uh, so I was in Alabama. I was covering University of Alabama, living in Tuscaloosa, but working for the Birmingham News. And one of the reasons that they hired me from, I was covering Mississippi State for the Jackson Mississippi newspaper. One of the reasons was I started a blog um, covering Mississippi State. And at that point, blogs were very new and fans seemed to like having timely information with all sorts of different stuff. And it's a little bit of personality, you know, that's different from the newspaper. Now it seems ridiculous and obvious, but then it seemed like a great idea. So, uh, Finally, I would say a couple months after I got hired at Alabama, they were like, all right, we're now ready for you to start the blog. What should we call it? I'm like, well, it should be named something clever and interesting and catchy and, you know, about kind of maybe Alabama since that's what I covered. They're like, how about rap sheet since, you know, your name starts with rap. And I'm like, actually not bad. And we went back and forth about the actual name because, you know, cover college football enough, you'll eventually cover some arrests and some things that aren't great. And would that be offensive? You know, Um, we decided it'd be okay. So the blog was called Rap Sheet. And when I went to go cover the Patriots for the Boston Herald, um, I took the name with me and that's kind of where we are. And no, and no trademark issues. So do you own the Rap Sheet, I guess, at this point? um, Based on the, sort of anecdotal discussions we've had uh if anyone tried to take it back because i've been using it so long yeah. i would probably have claim to it you guys would probably know better than i would um thankfully there's been really no issues and i think i'm the most like sort of noteworthy rap sheet out there aside from criminal rap sheets i guess yeah. um so there's it's been no battle neck. now i haven't Every- started to make haven't started to make like t-shirts or anything uh, and no one's <laughs> fought me on that. So if that ever happens, maybe we'll see if there's like a battle coming up. It's, it's a, it's a fair story. And when you mentioned uh, Boston, um, Bill was cringing, not that you're from there, Ian, but we've had a lot of our guests on our show in the last uh, year and a half that are from Boston. So Bill, I want to, I want to, uh, you're welcome. Ian's not from Boston. Um, you don't have to go into the Patriots small talk, but um, Ian, so where, where are you from? Tell us a little bit about, 
where you grew up and your siblings, your parents. Uh, give us a little sense of what, what childhood for little Ian looked like. Uh, all right, so I grew up in Chappaqua, New York, um, you know, about 45 minutes or 50 minutes from the city. Um, I grew up with both parents who actually still live there. Um, my dad's a doctor, mom's an educator, uh, has her, uh, is actually a doctor now, they're both doctors now, actually. Um, and I have a younger brother who uh, works in the city, and I have an older sister who also works in the city. She's a, a school teacher. And, you know, I would say it was like a fairly, for Westchester, at least, fairly typical uh, household, a lot of sports, um, yep. a lot of making fun of each other. Um, but, you know, a lot of a lot of sports and schoolwork is really what it was. So, but it's not, it sounds it sounds like your family, uh, both your parents and your siblings, took on the 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 notable jobs and careers of saving lives and teaching. What what happened to you? And when did I... <laughs> you know, I would say when so I went to Columbia after uh, obviously after high school, I went to private school in Tarrytown, a place called Hackley, and um, you know probably a year in. I started working for the Columbia Daily Spectator, like the student newspaper, and I knew I wanted to be a reporter then, like a newspaper reporter, which is really all I ever wanted to do. Mm. And my parents, you know, they were fine with it. I think they supported me, but I lived in, my, in their house for two years after college, making, you know, working part-time at the Journal News, making $12 an hour and no more for 30 hours a week and no more. Um, I'm not sure they were totally on board then. And yeah. I think the deal was after two years, if I had an advance, then I would probably have to go like think about law school or something like that. Thankfully, like two years on the dot, I ended up getting a job in Mississippi uh, where I moved to go cover Mississippi where, State. Where, so where you made $9 an hour. Where I made, you know how much I made? $33,000 a year. Yeah. And huh? I was so rich. Yeah. <laughs> well, and the, co well, the cost of living in Mississippi has got to be a fraction of New York. I mean, I think I paid $500 a month for my apartment, but the apartment was so big, it had two bedrooms, which at the time, again, was huge. So one bedroom where I slept in, the other bedroom was my office. And so started a long career of working very, very far away from where like my home office is. Like then it was in Jackson, but I lived in Starkville. Yep. Um, when I lived in Alabama, I worked in... I lived in Tuscaloosa, but the paper was in Birmingham. In Boston, I never went to the office. NFL Network's in LA. I live in New York. So, like, everyone's adjusting to the coronavirus life, um, working from home. And for me, I'm like, where have you guys been? Yeah, yeah, yeah we, this is yeah, what we, I do every day. Yeah, we talked about that a while back, not that long ago, a few weeks ago. And this is uh, – Although it seems like months in the coronavirus world, it, yes. It, it, it does. In corona, in corona world, it's like a, it's like a decade one day. Um, but, yeah, this is something that you're – we're going to get into that, that you're very used to, the, the home office and the setup. Um, hey, Ian, you, where, do you, where do you fall in terms of your – you have a brother and sister. Where do you fall? Uh, I'm the, the middle the, child. You know what? Oh, everyone's we, middle, Bill. We, Everyone. Every single person yeah. from season two has been a middle child. I, there's got to be something there that we got to research. Um, very interesting. Very interesting. So, so, so you, you go to Columbia. Um, now, you know, Columbia is a pretty damn good school. Um, and you knew you wanted to be a journalist. So you're headed towards a $30,000 salary no matter what. Like, like. T bring us through that. Like, did you know you wanted to be a journalist when, you know, you were in college or is it something you developed over the course of college? Uh, so I went to college thinking I wanted to be a lawyer. Got Ooh. it. And then, Saved. you know, not, not quite knowing what that meant, but it seemed like a good idea. And then, you know, I started writing. I always liked to write. Um, and I was a history major. So I liked the, the storytelling and the writing of history. And, uh, you know, I, I started working for the newspaper, saw my name in print a couple of times. People started to know me around campus. I liked that part of it. Yep. Um, and I just liked the process of writing. And, you know, I would say probably by my sophomore year, I knew I was going to be a newspaper guy. And then I got an internship at ESPN after my junior year working Ian, for ESPN class. Ian, bef Ian, before we get to ESPN, were there, was there anyone at that time when you were writing – that you, like, who was your inspiration or who was, who are people that you looked up to that you admired from, from, from the outside? I said, man, one day I want to be like that guy or that gal. 
Yeah, I would say probably three people. One, um, Rick Riley. You know, I was a big Sports Illustrated guy. He had the back page then. He was at the heyday of just being like the, you know, journalism icon. Uh, I dreamt of writing on the back page of Sports Illustrated, not knowing how different the magazine world would be, but, you know, that was probably my dream. Um, my favorite writer was Gary Smith, who worked for Sports Illustrated, wrote long form, just an incredible, you know, that, unfortunately, there's not a lot of that going on now, um, but yep. just you know, unbelievably, unbelievably beautiful writer. Just yep. dig deep and get, get in people's souls during features, which I always liked. Um, and then there was a Columbia graduate, Bob Clappish, um, who is, you know, like a New York City tabloid writer, but covered baseball. Uh, I'm a huge baseball fan. Huh. And so I'm like, all right, if I could, you know, I'd love to be Rick Riley. If I couldn't, covering baseball for one of the New York City tabloids would be just the best. That's kind of what I wanted to do. So, so Ian, did you, did you play a lot of sports growing up? Like, did you play for your high school team? Yeah, uh, I played football. I wrestled for four years and I played baseball. Nice. Um, and, you know, I would say I was, was pretty good. Um, I played, uh, tried out for the Columbia baseball team, played a semester and then didn't make it. Ended up as a lightweight rower uh, for four years at Columbia, which was intense and insane. The team was good. I wasn't very good. The team was great. Um, but it was just, you know, two practices a day, 6 a.m. and 4 p.m., just yeah. complete insanity. Um, but, yeah, it was always – I always loved sports, but, like, I always tell when, like, journalists ask me, young writers especially, you know, like, I want to work in sports, I always say the same thing. You have to like the writing. You have to like the reporting or mm -hmm. whatever it is, making documentaries, filming, whatever. You have to like that more than, like, sports. Right. Yeah. And, and also, like you're going to sit watching games the whole time. Right. And also part of the output of what a lot of people just see is like, hey, TV and and that's obviously sexy and attractive. And, and you know, you get to meet some great people. But the what you're saying is the core, the kind of the core of it, uh, which is the writing, the jur journalism, the storytelling, you have to fall in love with that. Do you do, do you find yourself doing a lot of mentoring and, and coaching with, with 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 those that are kind of rising up the ranks that want your job? Um, yeah, it's like, you know, same, same reason Tom Brady, like, you know, I mean, he'll, he'll help his backups, but mostly like, get to watch. Like, <laughs> you give them bad, give, you give them bad advice. Don't be taking my job. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I try to, um, the problem is now is there's a lot of it. Like people are, you know, yep. sliding in my DMS on Instagram, you know, hi, I'm a college reporter. Like I'd like some advice and I'd like to help everyone. The problem is I can't tell the difference between who's serious and who isn't, mm. who will really do this or who just kind of wants to say their, to their friends, I, I don't know. Um, so I will definitely like, I'll help out journalism schools and I'll, you yep. know, do like sort of journalism presentations and that kind of stuff and help the people I know. Um, but it's just, it's hard to, I don't know, it's hard, it's hard to weed through all the different people asking for stuff is kind of the weird best sure. way to say it. You know, it's, it, I was thinking of it this morning, you know, when, you know, every young kid who loves sports, you know, always dreams of like taking that final shot, you know, of like making it. Um, and then, you know, and then all of a sudden, you know, you get to a point where you realize like, hey, I'm not even the best kid on my little league team, you know, uh -huh. um, you know, probably not going to end up there. And everyone then I feel like, you know, goes to wanting to be involved with sports or cover sports, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's so interesting. Um, and we're going to get to that later. What I want to do is, is, is go back to, so now we know young Ian, we know you went to Columbia. We know you lived at your parents' house. They weren't necessarily thrilled that you, you know, decided to become a newspaper guy and stay in their house. They thought they were an empty nesters. No, they had little Ian come <laughs> back. Um, then also, so is your next job down South? Um, Bring us through yeah. kind of, I want to go, I want to, I want to go through the rise. So uh, I was covering mostly high school sports. I'd fill in and write like sidebars for Mets or Yankees, but for the journal news, that wasn't my job. My job was to cover high school sports. You know, I covered a couple like high school football state championships. I was the, you know, I'd go travel to Binghamton for the high school baseball state finals, like, you know, great stuff, great trips. You got to be on an expense account, which was just bananas to me at the time. Uh -huh. Um, and I was doing really well, but I was still part-time. 
So there's basically like 12 part-time reporters and three full-time guys. Everyone kind of had the same job, but three people got paid for it. There was an opening uh, at the Journal News. I was passed over for it. I cried like a baby. Um, and when I had a meeting with the sports editor, Mark Leary, who's since passed away, um, and he basically was like, here's why you're not getting the job. And my first response was, I was looking at the company website, a Gannett newspaper website. Yeah. There's a job opening in uh, Jackson, Mississippi to cover Mississippi State. I, I think I should leave. Would you help? And he was like, well, actually, you know, I happen to know the sports editor for the Clarion Ledger. He interned for me at USA Today like 20 years ago. If you'd really move to Mississippi, I would happily make a call for you. Uh -huh. Sure. I moved to Mississippi. So, but knowing that I had no experience covering the SEC, I barely knew the teams in the SEC, never been to Mississippi. So he called down, I applied for some reason, they interviewed me and I will never forget, you know, sitting in the living room of, uh, Rusty Hampton, the sports editor of the Clarion Ledger. And he was like, you know, why would you from New York or went to Columbia possibly come down to Mississippi to take a job like this? Yeah. And I was like, why would you hire me? Like, I don't have any experience <laughs> and I don't know anything about the SEC. <laughs> he's like, well, he's like, we, there might be something here. So he hired me. And so I somehow, so I left 24 single uh drove down to mississippi moved into an apartment and spent two years there you know got paid big bucks and the coach was sylvester croom was the first ian, uh, ian, ian quick question i went to school in yeah. carolina what was your first impression of uh of the south uh obviously different parts of the south i obviously uh my, i fell in love with sweet tea and grits and the, the southern draw and I was single then, so I can say that, um, you know, th that aspect and the sports culture right. and all that. What did, what did you, um, what was kind of eye popping for you um, from your first impression of the South and the people there? Um, people were nice. You know, that was weird to me. Yeah. Um, you know, I was always New York City and I could be sort of abrupt at times and you'd be sitting there and I, you know, I, I never had a problem like eating alone, for instance, or sitting alone. I don't really care. I still don't really care. So I'd go, you know, there's a bar, like basically on the street called the veranda. I'd go sit at the bar. I'd have dinner by myself, the just kind of hang out. And people would come talk. And I ended up becoming friends with a lot of like the really young, uh, like support staff and football coaches just from like sitting at the bar because people would randomly talk to you. Now what's crazy is huh. the people that like the really young assistants and support staff that I talked to were – Freddie Kitchens, huh. uh, who obviously was a Browns coach last year. Uh, yeah. Joe Judge was a special teamer, but he would go to the bar too, met him there. Uh, Amos Jones was, was on that staff. Shane Beamer, who's now at Oklahoma for Lincoln Riley, he was on that staff. I mean, it's, it's just crazy. What, what, was the name of, what, Ian, what was the name of the bar? The Rendezvous. Veranda. Veranda. Oh, so all, all you need to do is DM all these guys on your IG and tell them to go to the veranda and, and their, and their career <laughs> will, will skyrocket. That's, that, that, that's, that's it. just cut and paste the whole thing. By the way, Chris, I, 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 I love that you, you think like Carolina and Mississippi are, you know, on the same wavelength. Of, They're like a hundred miles apart. Of I mean, the South, you know, <laughs> like Mississippi is the South. So, you know, I mean, North Carolina thought, is like. I thought North, in South Carolina, they drank unsweetened tea. Isn't that right or no? Well, it's both. You can get your sweet tea and your unsweet. By the way, speaking at the bar, were you, were you kind of bringing, like, what was your drink of choice then, and when did you probably move over to bourbon where you had no choice coming into that part of the um, country? I would say I, was, I would just drink beer then. Yeah. Um, you know, and so we'd sit there just drinking beer, and I, I did try um, moonshine for the first time in that bar as well. Oh, yeah. Of course which, you did. With a bunch of, like, coaches, and, you know, I don't know if you've ever had, like, legit moonshine, but it, it's almost like makes you instantly drunk. And I started to like sweat and they thought this was really fun. Um, <laughs> but yeah, you know, it's beer at that time had not quite gotten into the world of, of bourbon just yet. So, so Ian, at any point you're in Mississippi, did you regret, you know, the decision or were you just like over the moon because you're finally getting paid to do what you, you set out your passion? Oh, I, I was good. I mean, I was, you know, it was very like lonely because, I didn't really 
took a, a while, took like a, a solid year to like actually make some friends that I could hang out with. Yep. Um, and then I met uh, my girlfriend at the time, who's now my wife, you know, a year and a half into that. Um, and I was only there for two years, but you know, it's, it was pretty lonely, but just the ability to do the actual job I wanted to do and get paid for it and like travel. And I mean, it was, there must have, it there, at all. there must have been some advantages to being lonely and not knowing everyone get, as far as focus and, and, and like kind of thinking about your, your career more obsessively rather than having a lot of distractions around you. I don't know. Do you, Oh, 100%. I think about it all the time because, you know, at each point when I've taken a new job, and it's been a little while, but, you know, when I got to Mississippi, I was by myself. So I literally just worked. That's it. I, I just worked and went to the bar. That's it. Played golf, maybe. Um, when I went to Alabama, I was dating Leah, uh, now my wife, and she stayed in Starkville, only 90 miles away, but stayed in Starkville to finish college. So I had basically three months of like just doing work. When I went to Boston, Leah was finishing something for her work as a bank manager in, uh, in Birmingham, actually. So I literally just had three months of starting like just to work. So that is like so important just to, when you get a new job, like all you have to do is just, just zero, new job. Zero in. We, uh, here, here, I'm sorry, sorry Chris, but this is, this ahead, is, no, I feel like I have breaking news because, you know, what Ian just said was, you know, he, he went down to Mississippi, he worked, covered, uh, he covered the SEC, uh, went to the bar, but in the middle of all that, he picked up a college student um, and made, made her his wife. I mean, that's not, that's not uh, bad. Now, to be fair, I was only like 25 at the time, so it wasn't like totally crazy, but uh, yeah, I would say uh, that's true. So, so now, how did you get the job at Alabama from Mississippi? Uh, so I've been covering Mississippi state for, you know, at that point, almost two years. Yep. And there was a job opening for the Birmingham news to cover Alabama. And, you know, it's a, it's actually weird. Cause thinking back, I didn't even want to apply because I was hoping in my like weird warped head that I would cover Mississippi state and then be good enough to get a job back up in New York. And that would be it. Cause that's all I want to do is get back to New York. And it doesn't really work like that. <laughs> so they, they force you to go to Boston first. <laughs> I mean, basically. Yeah. Um, so, so Leah, who at that point was kind of like just getting, we're just getting to know each other, but she was like, you have to apply for this job to cover Alabama. This is a massive job. Like, I know you don't think so, but you have to trust me. It is. And so I was like, all right. Wow. And I applied and uh, there were five finalists. I was one. I was pretty sure that this guy, Josh Kendall, who covered, I think Georgia for Macon, was getting it. I can't believe you uh, remember like everyone. Well, uh, well, well, what's also this incredible, like, is, like what's also incredible is we have Josh Kendall on right after you. So it's going to be amazing <laughs> to cross reference his opinion. He's as still well. around. He's still, he's still. We've never liked sports. Josh Ian. We've never liked Josh. <laughs> In all seriousness, Josh uh, probably did me one of the biggest favors ever. I've never actually asked him about this, but this is what I was told. So all of these things are being followed on like these journalism message boards, like journalismjobs.com. So it was like this gossip circle. So everyone was like discussing who was getting what job and everyone knew Josh Kendall was getting the Alabama job. And then for family reasons, he pulled out of the job and I got mm. it. And I don't know if I would have got it or not. I have no idea. Um, I've never asked him, but That's I ended incredible. up getting it against like all odds and so, you know, some of that was because of the blog, I said, because of the blog I started and they wanted to get really deep into that. Ian, let me, um, I'm going to make you um, uh, brag about yourself for a minute. At this stage, we all, regardless of your career path, everyone knows that they have, you know, an edge. I'm not going to use superpowers because that's too obvious. And we, 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 you're not allowed to tell us ours, uh, yours. We're going to tell it for you, as you know. <laughs> but, but, but jokes aside, what is the edge that you believe that you have in your head what is it that you're doing differently or you see differently that these other four candidates, and not that you know what the other four candidates, but I think you understand what I'm asking. Like, what is your approach to, to your, your path of, of, of coverage? That's a good question. I mean, I would, I would think a couple of things that just kind of come to mind. One is I work a lot and I like it. And whenever I talk to young reporters, I'm always like, if you like your job, don't be shy about it. Just tell people. People like to hire people who like to work. 
Why? Because yeah. you're going to be sitting in an office with them. And if they're in a good mood, it makes you in a good mood as well. I've always liked to work. I like reporting. Um, I'm also like very, very open about how to do things. So like access is a big thing in journalism. And I never cared whether I would get access or not. Like are the locker rooms open or not? Are the players media friendly or not? Because if they weren't, I would just find another way. And I think that's one thing that's really helped. So, you know, diving into like, what's a blog? Oh, I don't know, but let me start one and see how hmm. I can give people a ton of information. What's Twitter? I don't know. Like, let me okay. just start it and that will help. Like all of these, I started doing videos at Alabama because I don't know why not. People seem to like, like all these different ways to get at reporting. I was always really open to, and I was also young. Um, so, you know, I didn't have a lot going on and I could just work a ton. By, by the way, Ian, sorry, Bill, one comment. I just pulled up your, uh, your Twitter. Uh, and for those, uh, not that you need any more followers, um, at rap sheet. So you joined September, 2008 and that's early. That's, uh, that's, 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 that's 12 years, right? September, um, 2008. So that would be yeah. after my second year, I believe covering Alabama. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, it's, it's interesting because even if there were people with more experience who are much older, they probably didn't invest in creating a blog. Uh, why would they? They had massive viewership elsewhere, right? They've been writing for years and years. So it's interesting that maybe, you know, uh, you, know you got a job uh, at an early age because you were kind of leaning forward and adopting technology so that was an, so kind of being young then was an advantage. Whereas now you got to have scale, you got to have followers, you got to, you know, it's much harder, I would say now. Um, but maybe you benefited by that, you know, back yeah, then. I thought about that and I was, you know, I'm not young anymore. I mean, I wear makeup so people think I'm young, but I'm not young anymore. Um, but I was always, you know, at when I was covering Mississippi, youngest covering Alabama. I mean, it was basically me at 26 and everyone else was like 40 or 50 because this was a you know covering Alabama is a job that you could have for the rest of your life it's a great job yeah. um and I was just always same thing with covering the Patriots for the Herald like I was always you know so, one of so the you youngest get, so so you get you get down so you get you get the job at Alabama um like does Nick Saban just like open the door for you do you like what do you how do you you know how do you create those relationships do you go to the bar do you find the you know the, the, the next, next veranda the next veranda. Um, uh, Innisfree would be the uh, would be the Tuscaloosa bar. Um, it was very different at Alabama. So when I got there, it was a good job. You know, you're covering Alabama for the Birmingham News is a good job. Uh, you know, they were okay. Uh, I covered a Independence Bowl my first year. They were fine, but still good job. A traditional power. And then Mike Shuler gets fired, and they bring on Nick Saban after a 38 day coaching search, which was like the biggest nightmare I've ever been a part of um and oh, so, so Saban was not there when you when he came not out. there yeah. very yeah. interesting so all of a sudden everyone's reading everything I'm writing and he and I battled very aggressively my first our first year together because you know there was discipline stuff and there was who was getting kicked off the team and recruiting and you know, everyone was looking for everything to kind of pick at them. So teams were turning them in for recruiting violations and stuff. And, and I covered all of it. And I sat in the front row. I always asked the first questions about it. And, you know, every time I, and I called him Nick instead of coach, which on the <laughs> message boards was a very big deal. So we battled for like a year, second year. By, by the way, why, why, did, why, did you, understanding. why didn't you, cause that's like What's a, that? not a Southern thing to do. Why would you call him Nick and not coach? Uh, because it's his name, <laughs> you know, so he people, probably thought people Man, lost their minds. This fucking New Yorker comes down South and doesn't give me the respect. No, he didn't care. It was just the fan. That's what's crazy. He oh, hated me for other reasons. I'm sure. Right. Okay. Um, and you're cool. Wait, you're cool with us calling you Ian, right? Yeah. No. <laughs> uh, yeah. It is funny. What I get a kick out of is when people in sports do this a lot. They'll call someone coach who's not a coach. Like when Tom Coughlin's with the Jaguars, everyone called him coach. And I'm like, he hasn't coached for like 10 years. What are we doing? Whatever. Um, Ian, we're going to get back to makeup too. I want to, uh, cause we have a, we have a, a, uh, some ground to cover. So how, uh, let's, let's, let's transition up to Boston. Um, by, and, by the way, let me, let, I'm sorry, Chris, but let, 
the interesting part about this and and at every point in someone's career even the most successful people being at the right place at the right time having a little bit of luck never hurt at any never hurt anyone i i kind of feel like if nick saban was there and alabama was the the you know the alabama program under saban that you, there wouldn't have been five applicants for that job there would be 50 applicants for that job right so, right place yeah I mean, no, yeah, there were there were a lot more than five applicants, just fifty five finalists. But okay, got um, it. But 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 still, though, you're right. I mean, I think about this all the time. It was a good job at the time, but to cover, you know, getting one of those jobs now, for instance, as they've established like this you know, national prominence, um, it's impossible. Everybody would want it, you know. Then I just I don't know. Uh, and then you're right, like getting the job when it was kind of like a sleeping giant. And then yep. being there when it exploded, that yep. helped me. And then you, you, I you asked about the Boston thing. Basically, the way that happened was they posted a job, Boston Herald did, and they hadn't hired anyone from outside Boston in 20 years. Huh. Um, they posted a job. You needed NFL experience, which obviously I didn't have any. Um, and I wrote them this long letter detailing how I covered Nick Saban, you know, with limited access. Yep. And how I would use that experience to cover Bill Belichick and the Patriots, also limited access. Mm. Uh, and I sent it away and literally thought nothing of it. And then they called me and were like, we'd like to interview. Um, so they flew me from Baton Rouge, where I was covering a uh, college basketball game, to Boston and then back home and interviewed and then Four months later, I somehow got the job. Pretty did you want? Did you want to? Did you want to leave, or were you exploring? Meaning, when you got the job, you're like, "Oh shit, Leah, we gotta, we're leaving." Like, was it something that was it time to go? Um, no, I would say when we were in Alabama, it was awesome because we had we had a great group of friends. You know, we we had like a really good situation, really good setup. I was in a good place with saving with coverage i was breaking a lot of stories um i was in a really good spot and you know the only reason i would leave would be for something very big yeah or if i right. could you know get back to the east coast for like a major job and then it was this time. came up and i applied and i literally thought there was zero chance that you i would get job. it and then somehow they hired me and i was like and i'm you know, we had and then so like when the, the birmingham news was going back and forth about like you know we would offer you more money. I was like, don't. It's like, I have <laughs> to take it. Just don't. What's uh, any, any, any good stories for Bill, uh, Bill and I and our audience uh, from your time uh, down in the South, um, whether it was with the players or coaches, something that you haven't shared with anybody could have been just like a, the, you know, the wrong moment, an embarrassing moment, something, something that you, uh, that you laugh about now or cringe about. Uh, all right, I'll give you I'll give you two good ones. Uh, one from, and I don't know, I don't know if you guys will find this funny, but everybody else thought this was funny, uh, in the <laughs> South at least. So I was interviewing this guy David Stewart, who ended up playing played for Mississippi State. His nickname was Country because he was very country, very <laughs> country. He ended up playing right tackle for the uh, Titans for a long time, um, and he hated interviews, hated them. Huh. But I'm, you know, I'm supposed to profile a different person each day for this like feature we're doing, and he finally agrees to let me talk to him, and it's like horrible. He barely says anything. I'm like, okay, fine. So I go find his offensive line coach, and I ask him, I'm like, yeah, he's got ton talking to country. Like he, he barely said anything. He's like, <laughs> and I'm like interviewing him, and he's like, you know, all he cares about is hunting, fishing, and frog kicking. <laughs> I'm like, okay. So I think that's a funny line. So I write huh? in the paper, hunting, fishing, and frog kicking. <laughs> and I'm like, okay. I write it. It gets through. The next day, all over like the message boards, like, look what this Yankee reporter did. Because it's actually <laughs> frog digging, which is you stand in the river and you try to like stab frogs with a little staff and you get them. But I'd never heard of that. So I thought it was frog kicking, where you, I guess you just kick frogs. Anyway. <laughs> my my yankee and experience there it's um, it's 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 funny trust me it's funny <laughs> so still the fact that it got through the copy desk still ridiculous all right and then the other one was um 
So I'm at SEC Media Days in 20, 2009. And I had accepted the job to cover the Patriots. Uh, and I'm not really, I mean, I'm kind of working, but like, I'm not really working. I'm mostly just there to like, have everyone tell me how great I am, congratulations. And then to say goodbye to Saban. So hmm. you know, I pull him aside. I'm like, I'm like, hey, I want to talk to you. He's like, I heard you're leaving. You know, I guess congratulations. You know, and he said some other like kind of funny stuff. And I'm like, hey, look, you know, I know you and Belichick are close. Um, if you wouldn't mind, if you could kind of like put in a good word, just tell him, you know, that I'm whatever you want, you know, that I'm fair. I'm a decent guy. Like, that I'm, uh, that think, I'm a fraud kicker. Yeah, basically. <laughs> uh, I, think, I think that would really help. And he goes, you want me to tell my best, to talk to my best friend in the world and fucking lie to him? <laughs> like, oh, right. that, oh, there you go. Clear, clearly, ha clearly had a relationship with him. Uh, whether, 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 you know, sometimes your, your nemesis or, you know, your competitor as, as we're watching the last dance right now, there's always uh, you hate him, but there's a respect there. I don't know if that's what it was. But something so, like that. So, so, I mean, and it, now when Sabin and I see each other, we're great, by the way. Yeah. So, you know, it's, you know, it's interesting, um, you know, and, and this is, you know, there are parallels to almost any industry and any career path, but you know, it's, you know, so, you know, it's interesting because some people say, Hey, bet the jockey, not the horse. Right. And, um, if you were to ask, you know, football, like avid football fans, like the two biggest personalities and people you'd want to cover in college and in pro, you know, and by the way, not the easiest to cover because, but we'll get to Belichick, but you know, it, it, you know, you, you, you got one, you got them both. Right. I mean, it's Saban in college. It's Belichick in the NFL. Like, it's like, what, you know, if you, if you got that job back in New York, you know, covering Eric Mangini and the Jets, you know, you probably wouldn't be the, the Ian Rappaport that you are today. It's, it's, it's interesting. Yeah. I mean, I think about, I don't think there's any other reporters who've covered Belichick and Saban. Um, I, I mean, I've thought about, it. I don't think there are, but both have been so different, so interesting, so hard to cover. Mm, yeah. Um, and so rewarding when you do get something. So that's why like whenever, you know, like whenever there's a hard subject or hard thing to get at, I'm kind of like, okay, like I've seen all this before. Right. You know, like it doesn't get any harder than trying to get information out of, you know, Alabama when Saban's in charge, you know? So, so, so same thing, you know, how do you break through to Belichick, right? I mean, covering him, you know, I, I got to believe four out of five days, you're just banging your head against a, against the wall because he, he sometimes he just gives you nothing yeah and and I never really minded that uh now first of all you know there would always I think we came to me and Bill kind of came to an understanding pretty early that like there was always questions out and he's been there before so it's not like I'm setting the flag on anything but um there's always questions I'm gonna ask he gets it he'll either answer or he doesn't and I never like went nuts trying to be like, why won't you tell me about this injury? You kind of ask, mm -hmm. say whatever, yes or no, or something or nothing. And then you kind of move on. So I always do my job. He'd do his job. Um, but I think for him, you know, there were, there were a couple things um, that I think kind of helped me break through a little bit. Um, one was I was never shy about asking. So, you know, I was always like, I'd be like the guy at the bar who like talks to, you know, 20 different girls and doesn't care if he get turned down. Right. Um, I would request a lot of things. So we'd request one-on-ones -on with him for a bunch of different things. And sometimes he would say, yes. So you go into a little room, you pull him aside for five minutes, you ask him about something sensitive or that maybe he, you, that you didn't want to discuss in front of other people. And he always got that because he knew that he was giving you something that others didn't have. So in those settings, he'd really be great. And I just don't think a lot of people asked because it's like, you're never going to get a one-on-one -on -one with Belichick or whatever. So we did that. And then the other thing was, um, you know, I went to a couple of his charity events and I was thinking I'd go and talk to him. But, you know, in the end, you, you know, you kind of sit, you watch him interact. He's doing good charity stuff. Um, but then I, I, you know, I asked to talk to him at the end of it. And he kind of like blew me off. He's like, I'll get you another time. And I was like, okay. But then I never really wrote about it. And I think he appreciated mm. me not publicizing the charity stuff. 
And he at one point called me and gave me an exclusive because he had said like, I'll get you another time. And I was like, Oh, that's kind of interesting. You know, and you, like, you, you saw, you saw a pattern with dealing with him. I, I, I would think too, Ian, that the, your time with Alabama and Saban, um, he probably would have respected the fact that you, you, you were there. You, you obviously worked, you know, covered his, his, his friend. Um, uh, did he ever ask you any questions as it relates to the 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 team or your time there or anything like that do you think that was pretty much one-on-one with with Saban any it, like did, did was the conversation always around the Patriots and the team and personnel or did it ever expand beyond that um sometimes he would he would kind of ask about like you know how they did this or that at Alabama the problem with Belichick is he knows everything so yeah. like whenever first of all he can get to anyone anytime Belichick calls whoever it is you're answering Right. So he, and so he always knew everything. And the other thing is Saban learned from him for a lot of it. So it's not like he needed to ask questions a lot, um, but it would come up from time to time. I mean, he would, you know, Belichick would always bring it up sometimes as a way to make fun of me. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny. I, um, I, I and I imagine you probably had uh, when you, when you hear Patriots players talk about him, he, he seems to have a pretty uh, interesting and, and weird sense of humor. I'm not sure if you saw, you saw that side. Did you enjoy He's very that? funny. Did you enjoy uh, living in the Boston area? And where did you live? Oh, loved it. Still, yeah. I mean, I, I like where we live now, but um, we lived in Southie. And, um, Southie. We lived, it was just, just the greatest. And it was, you know, it was not like, obviously, like old time Southie. It was kind of in the middle of the transition now to getting a lot younger and probably more expensive. Yeah. Um, we lived on uh, K and 8th, down the street from L Street Tavern, which is still my favorite bar in the whole world. Um, as you know, publicized by Goodwill Hunting, but really just a great bar. Yep. And, you know, a place now we, we still, when we visit Boston now, we still go by that bar and still see some people we know, still the wow. bartenders are the same. Um, we, I mean, could not have loved Boston more. And I was, I was good living there for a long time. Like I didn't, I didn't seek to leave Boston. Like I was, I was set. I, we were fine Loved for it. a while. And you keep saying we, and I know obviously this is Leah, but so she's, She's up there with you. You're, you guys are you're, you're on this journey together. And I, I like that how Bill asked that question, not only on the rise from the personal side, but also as, as we're with it on the personal uh, uh, with your relationship. So you're obviously you're, you're doing this together. Uh, you're growing together. She's she's in, is she is Leah working in Boston and she's got her. her yeah, career growing? she she was she, she was a bank manager in uh, in Alabama, came up to Boston and didn't really want to do that. So she became a manager at Starbucks and then continued doing that. When we moved to Dallas for NFL network. Um, and then, you know, when we had two boys, she eventually stepped down to barista uh, and now is officially retired. But yeah, um, <laughs> yeah she was, she was managing uh, a uh, Starbucks in Brookline actually when we were there, which was awesome. Um, our nemesis. Beautiful. Yeah. Hey, did you ever, so what did you call Belichick? Did you call him coach or you call him Bill? Bill. Nice. There's a, there's a pattern happening here. Now was, was there, was there a time, right? Because the one thing I can tell, you know, being a New Yorker and other than football, I'm, I love all my New York teams. Um, and you know, like, and bo- the huge rivalry between Boston and New York, like, did you, was there any, you know, when you got there, people were like, Oh, look at this, you know, New Yorker covering Boston sports. Was there any of that? No, I mean, I think they probably thought of me more as someone from Alabama anyway. Yeah. Um, yeah. But what's weird is like, you know, I, I grew up rooting for the Jets, but you do this enough and people are always like, oh, well, you know, you have to be unbiased. It doesn't really work like that. You just like become unbiased. Like you don't, I got, now I'm not like, oh, I can't root for this team. You just don't. It's just yeah. your, my brain is wired differently. So like, <laughs> I don't watch a game and root. I'm interested in what happens and yeah. I'm, like if the people I like, you know, won some games or didn't get fired, but it just, it works so differently. Like I can't even remember having feelings when the Jets won. I'm still a Mets fan. That's what I root for. Yeah. Like it's so, you're so divorced from like emotionally being invested in a win or a loss that I can't even fathom so what that was like. You're too close so, to it. It makes sense that you're, uh, you're still, you're, you'd root for your, uh, your baseball team though. Go ahead, Bill. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, with the Mets, there's not much to root for. But anyway, um, that is true. so uh, w- was there was there like a 
something you really uncovered and broke um, with, you know, in Boston that, re you know, that got your name at the national level? You know, or was it, or was uh, it like just a series of things? It's a good question. Um, it's funny because like, I can't remember. I remember all the things I got beat on. Uh, I, I can't remember specifically like really big stuff I broke, although I'm sure I did. Um, I think what it was a lot was, you know, I had, I had a blog, which I literally blogged 10 times a day, like yeah. literally 10 times a day. And in my off days, I would, you know, set the automatic blog function and I would write things. So it would, it never stopped. So it was basically just like, I was like a nonstop fountain of Patriots information. Um, and I had a lot of, you know, exclusives with players. I was really good at getting guys in the locker room who didn't talk to a lot of people. Um, you know, I got Belichick a bunch, you know, I, I would, like, let's see, like Randy Moss one time on, um, you know, it was like June 2nd or something, whatever. Um, I get a call from this guy who's like, uh, Hey, Ian, uh, it's Donnie Blue. I'm like, hey, he goes, do you have time to speak to Randy Moss? And I'm like, I mean, yeah, I, I, do I, yeah, I have time to speak to Randy Moss. And I just put ribs on the smoker. And so, you know, you put ribs on the smoker and you got, I was using a, a gas smoker at the time. So I had, you know, probably seven hours. I'm like, yeah, I got time. So you got, right, Randy's going to call you. I'm like, okay. So then Randy Moss calls me, gives me this big exclusive about like a million things, <laughs> uh, which ended up being like a two day, you know, Herald front page. No one else got him. Um, and so I wrote, I interviewed him, transcribed, put up a blog post, took the ribs out, sauced them, wrapped them in foil, put them back. Another blog post, wrote the story, sent it in, <laughs> ate dinner. Did you clean? Yeah, but that, 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 that was, I would say that was a very high profile one. Were, you were obviously eating and cleaning your hands in between this. So one, one thing I just realized as you're telling this story, the speed of which you have to, um, you, you have to kind of execute from when you hear a story and, and I've, I've kind of, you know, wit, witnessed to, to seeing you kind of do, do your, do your art. It must, I mean, I'm just kind of thinking about how your brain is wired in all these years of sort of writing the ability to kind of, hear information, dissect it, and then very quickly package it so somebody on the other end can unpack it, right? Like, I imagine a lot of this art and skill had come from, because you've mentioned writing consistently through your, mm -hmm. which I did not know uh, through, this, through this conversation, but can you talk a little bit about that, that, that science of hearing something and how you, like, what you write and how you write it? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a really weird world. So, like, I will, you know, I'm going out, going about my daily day and making phone calls and you're hearing things and, you know, whatever. Um, but one of the weirdest things about my world is everything could be normal. And then I'll get a phone call or I'll hear something and everything changes. And I have had to train myself to be like, okay, stop. Like, this is a thing. Don't do anything else. Figure this thing out. I had an example, you know, two weeks ago or whenever that was. So I'm making my pre-draft phone calls and, you know, I'm calling a million people from like 7 a.m. to 10 p.m. just on the phone all day long, hearing a million things. I take my notes, I some I report, some I don't, it's like just, you know, a million things. And someone says to me, you're on this Gronk thing, right? I'm like, what do you mean? You know, the Gronk thing. I'm like, what Gronk thing? You know, he's, yeah, he's probably going to go to the Bucks. Hold on, what are you talking about? <laughs> and first, like, yeah, I can't really say much more, but you know, you probably should make some phone calls. So then it was like, okay, stop. Don't do anything else. Don't answer the phone. Don't do anything else. Figure this out. So I went from zero to breaking the uh, Gronk story that he was going to the Bucks Tampa. in about six minutes. It, and three sources confirm in six minutes and that, they tweeted it. That was, our, yeah. that, that was the question for, for, for our viewers is what, what are you looking for? Like you, you're calling sources that you're, you're basically putting your life and the, the rap sheet name and NFL, your job on the line that they're giving you the right information, right? Talk, who are these people? 
And then is there a trifecta here, like triangulate, where like when you have three, you move forward, but if you hear it from one source, it's not Or is enough? it two? You know, it used to be yeah. kind of two reliable sources. But, you know, well, in, this, in this day and age, you know, you know, anyone, if they just, if you said, hey, if someone said, hey, are you covering this Gronk thing? Like, what do you think of it? You know, oh, you, you can just get on Twitter and be like, hey, uh, sources say, you know, so, yeah, how do you, how do you triangulate that? You know, do you, do you have to have at least two sources or is it a judgment call? Well, I would say, you know, hopefully you have two sources, but there's other times when you have just one source and it's the person, right? Yeah. So yeah. like, let's say my source is a player and he's like, just tore my ACL, pretty good source. Yeah. You know, if it's the agent saying, I just got out the phone with my player, he tore his ACL, pretty good source, right? If it's, hey, this deal's getting done okay, well, let's say I get it from an agent. Usually that's good, but like, you just never know. Yeah. So then I would check with someone from a different side, team side, be like, all right, hey, I'm going to report this, just kind of running this by you, good to go. And, and, like, and yeah, then Ian, how, how, do you, how do you manage being first versus your friend, you know, Adam at ESPN or anyone else, right? Like, how do you, how do you think about, this is a developing story versus this is the story. And also that kind of credible credibility piece, which leads me to my other question is, have you ever broken something incorrectly? Yeah. Uh, so mainly it's like in my, so in my head, I got a lot of stuff. Right. Uh, and there are some things where you have, and you put it out right away, a player signing. Okay. Put it out right away, get the money later, but really just you want to break the signing. And then there's other stuff like, all right, I hear this person's name is up for trade discussions. Okay. And it's like, I wouldn't really report that. I just, I don't know. That's not, it's news, but it's not that exciting. I'd like to break the bigger story, which is he got traded here. Mm. So like yeah. when DeForest Buckner got traded to the, uh, the Colts, I knew about that for a month and a half. And I sat on it. I kept it quiet. I worked mm. it for multiple sides. Mm. Ended up breaking it with the terms and him having a new contract because I held it for a month and a half and didn't say anything to anyone. So there's just different choices of like, you know, how you put things out. And like, you know, I was pretty confident that no one else had that and I was going to put it out. So like that you kind of save. Yeah. Um, and then to answer your other question, the biggest story I ever broke um, was Alabama agreeing to terms with Rich Rodriguez. And it's true. They, his agent agreed to terms with Alabama. My sources were involved in the deal. I knew the years. I knew the terms. He had staff approval. The deal was done. And I broke it. Huge story. Scrolling on the bottom of SportsCenter. And then he changed his mind the next day after he met with his team. And uh -huh. he got a huge raise at West Virginia. Yeah. And I was like villain number one. Yeah, I've never been through any death threats. Like I've never been through anything like that in my life. Wow. Everyone telling me my story was wrong. My sports editor went on Paul Feinbaum to support me and basically say the story is right. Like it turned yeah. out to be wrong. Yeah. But the story was right. Wow. Yeah. Uh, and That's that was, crazy. you know, that That's was crazy. pretty ugly, but it was also. It true. can happen. Sometimes the reporting actually changes what the news ends up being. Right? Yeah. Hey, Ian, was there ever a time that you're, you know, uh, you know, you know, on an intimate dinner with your wife or like you have a, one of your kid, one of your boys birthday um, and like, you know, something breaks and like you, your job, you know, d d does everyone that you surround yourself with personally just understand at any given time? You have to go and drop things and go do stuff. Bill, or? Bill, let's get Leah in for this part. Uh, Ian, could you, <laughs> could, I'm telling you, she's a hoot, Bill. If she was in for this part, it would basically yeah. uh, be the top rated part of the whole show. I will say, and I don't, I don't think I'm sharing any secrets here. Uh, she currently has, sorry, I'm declining a phone call as I talk to you guys. She currently has blue hair right now. Um, <laughs> Cause it's quarantine and she had nothing else to do. So, um, so she would make quite an appearance here. Um, uh, the main thing is, is, hold on, let me respond to this text. No sure. No, no, it's breaking news. I'm going to make sure it's news not here at the superpowers podcast. Um, you know, the main thing is if it's real, everyone understands like, yep. Hey, I, I gotta go. And if I say that, like, 
Leah and the boys, like they know they like it's real and I got to go and it's urgent and I just have to. And, you know, it's come at some very inopportune times. Um, now a lot of times, like, um, you know, a lot of times I will, I can step away. I can confirm something. I can tweet it and maybe do like a phone interview if I'm out and then be done and come back in like eight or nine minutes, you know, cause TV segments aren't that long. Yeah. Whereas if I was a newspaper reporter, like go write a story. It's a little different, you know? So, so Ian, you just teed this up. Um, t- t- uh, t- share the story of, um, of uh, I think one of your sons, I don't know if it was Jude or Max, uh, per- perhaps joining your, your show um, without, without your, uh, I don't know if you've seen yeah. this bill, but it's, it's, it's kind of, oh, yeah. the main one was the CNN guy a couple of years ago, but you got to tell this one. Yeah, this was a good one. So um, we were, we had worked on Des Bryant signing somewhere forever, literally yeah. forever. Yeah. Um, and finally we break it that he's signing with the saints. Massive story at this point. Like he was, you know, this was big news. So it's like, we break it. Okay. Need in, need you on TV. Ran downstairs, put my makeup on, put my stuff on, jump in front of the camera. All right. Jude was homesick from school that day. So I'm in the basement now. He's right outside the door watching like a movie or something, lying down on the couch, like barely moving, sick. So Leah is sitting with him and she says, Jude, stay here. I'm going to go make you lunch. Don't go in daddy's office. And I just got a lock for the office that day. So we're fine. So then I'm literally on TV talking about Des Bryant. And all you see, all you see is this. And I'm like, the remote. I'm like, Jude. He goes, <laughs> And it's just literally the remote. And so, and I'm like, cause he, to him, an emergency was he couldn't figure out how to pause it. So, and it, at that point I, my, we're literally like, I'm talking on the air and I have two options. I could like kick him, which I really wasn't really going to do, or I could just suck it up. And I pulled him, put him on my lap and I continued talking. And I was, I was ready to go. Everyone else lost their minds. So they were like cracking up like crazy. But I literally sat there talking with him on my lap and he sees himself in the monitor because I have a return monitor. He's like making faces at himself and he thinks this is the funniest thing. (laughs) Um, But I was like, now if I just locked the door like I'm supposed to do, it probably would have been okay. But that's hysterical. It, it comes, it comes, it comes with the territory. And I've seen some of your, uh, your former, uh, well, not your former, your current colleagues. I think they really enjoy uh, the the banter is very real amongst you guys uh, and, and the teasing and the camaraderie. That's good. So Ian, how long are you covering, uh, how, how long are you in New England, um, you know, covering Boston sports? And then how did you get the NFL job? So I'm there for, for, th- for three years. Okay. And again, like I'm fine. Like I'm happy here. I started to do a little TV, you know, you make like 200, 300 bucks a night, just doing a couple of TV stuff, like which is a lot of money. It was great. And then I'm at the Super Bowl. Uh, the second Patriots Giants and I get a call from this guy who had kind of like you know arranged for me to do like a guest spot here or there for NFL Network they had beat writers on at the time just doing some stuff so he's like hey would you mind meeting with a couple of bosses and I'm like mm-hmm, okay like you know he sends me where it's going to this like conference room I'm wearing like jeans and a sweater or something I sit down um, at a table with these three bosses and they're kind of like firing questions at me and it goes on for an hour and, you know, they're like, all right, well, we've talked to, you know, journalism questions and all these different things. And they're like, all right, well, do you have any questions for us? And I'm like, yeah, what am I doing here? <laughs> I'm like, oh, uh, well, we're thinking about hiring, you know, we're going to hire another TV reporter. You're one of the guys we're considering. I'm like, oh, well, I don't know anything about TV. And they said, that's okay. We'll teach you. And by the way, would you move to Dallas? <laughs> And I was like, actually, like I had gone down the road with the Dallas Morning News to cover the Cowboys the year before. They ended up not opening up the job. But like, I was pretty sure I was going to get it. Like, they took us house hunting, me and Leah. Wow. So, like, Leah took the trip with me. Um, I was pretty sure I was going to get it, and they just never opened it up. I was like, actually, we almost moved to Dallas last year. So, like, yeah, for the right job, sure. So, I left the meeting. I called Leah, and I'm like, you're never going to believe this but I think something's happening. And like, I don't know, like I, I, I something, I, I think we might have to move. 
She said, calm down. Like they probably interview a lot of people and they did, but I could tell like something was up. And so they called me a month later, they offered me a job and it's like, okay, moved to Dallas. Was there for three years, but a hey, year in. Hey, Ian, um, Ian one, quick, been, one, one quick question about sure. your interview process. Most people, I guess this is, I would do this, is when, when somebody asks you or says you don't, uh, or you say, uh, rather than saying you don't have any TV experience, you know, there's more of this like, hey, I can do anything, I'll take it. You have this very <laughs> honest, like, dude, I, it's the second time I've heard this, like, I'm not the right guy for the job. Like, what's wrong with you? Like, wh- you're not you know, winging like, it, fake it till you make it. I mean, what's up? Nah. Nah, it's just, I'd just rather be up front right off the bat, you know? Right. Uh, also, it's true, and they're going to figure it out. Right. So yeah. I was like, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I mean, there's been a bunch of jobs where I was hired thinking like, wow, I cannot believe they're actually hiring me. Um, <laughs> you know, and this was definitely one of them. Oh, it's, like, it seems like every job, anything. every job you started, like, I can't believe they're hiring me, you know? That's true, though. But that's, that's pretty real. I mean, it's, you know, like when I went to cover the Patriots, like, I didn't know anything about covering an NFL team, literally nothing. Went to NFL Network, knew nothing about uh, TV working. I knew how to report, but yeah. I didn't know how to work in TV at all. I mean, it's just, you know, so when you, crash so course when, each way. So when you first get to NFL, you're, you're in Dallas. What, what's, the, what's the first job? Do you go right on air? Did they send you to media training? Like, what do, um, what do you do? I went to LA for like three or four days of like training, just like how to hold the microphone and stuff like that. You know, but I was so far away from being, like, knowing how to do it. But then they kind of send you out and you, you know, I mean, I was basically our Dallas Bureau reporter. It's kind of like Ed Werder did for years, mm-hmm. but for NFL Network. Um, and so you sent, they sent me to a bunch of different places to kind of get, to figure it out. And I was really bad at the beginning. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, I had one, like, particularly terrible time where I, like, completely forgot what I was supposed to say on air, just totally blanked and, then there was another one where I was in Minnesota and I was just, just terrible. And you know, when you're bad TV, it looks like you're reading. Yeah. It looks like you're trying right. to like trying to read on a telepump. It looks terrible. And that's what I looked like. Um, and I remember thinking I was going to get fired. Um, and did you, did you have a kind of a rec- recovery plan or path or did they help you with that it, when you're in that sort of moment of like, this isn't working? Um, I remember talking to my boss and I was like, basically like, I'm not getting any better. Like I'm terrible. And it's obvious, you know, they stopped having me go live You'd have to tape everything, which again is kind of awkward, but like, you know, I pride myself now on like literally any situation I could jump in front of the camera and talk, you know, but then it wasn't like that. So I was like, well, I need to practice. I'm like, if you really want to practice, you can go to the Cowboys facility and we have NFL network has cameras in all the facilities which we own, but, you know, you you see the backdrop behind everything. So they're like, there's a producer who's always in there during the overnight shift. He's doing nothing. You can just do fake hits to him and kind of work on stuff. Mm -hmm. So I did that a bunch, spent an hour for like three or four times and just figured it out. And so the next, the next thing I did was training camp in Charlotte, like to start the next season. And I get a call from one of my bosses that was like, I don't know what you did over the summer, but like that actually sounded decent. So like, the, okay. the, 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 the practice, the practice paid off. And on, on the, on the question around makeup, how long did it take to get comfortable with it? And do you carry makeup in your back pocket, in your car? Do you have bags of makeup all over the house? Your um, makeup, Leah's makeup, whose makeup is it? I have my makeup bag right here. A little brown bag. Or <laughs> oh, little that's black nice. Bag. Yep. Um, I use Mac and I use Sephora. I have a Mac pro card. Um, so they know me when I go in, you know, uh, I've never been, I never minded makeup. I don't really care. Uh, it actually helps. So I put it on myself. I'm pretty good at it. Yep. Uh, some and, training for that. And what's really great is, is when you have to do it in public, so like you're around people, you know, or fans, you're standing there like in front of a crowd and you're just kind of like putting on your little makeup <laughs> and whatever. Just whatever, you know? So, so, so Ian, you, uh, you, know, you fumbled the ball a couple of times. You, you, you went back and you practiced. Uh, you, your compliment was basically like, hey, you didn't suck um, on the training camp. When did you start becoming natural? And then, and then, you know, did you see as you were getting better and better, you know, uh, on the camera, you know, did, did you just see your career and your brand just take off? Like, bring us through um, kind of that, that cycle. 
Yeah, so I did a year, basically a year covering the Cowboys, a season. And that season, I was, I was fine. I was good. I, I, got, I would script everything at the beginning. And then I got better when I would just kind of keep bullet points in my head just to talk about. Because like everything else, I mean, you guys have given presentations. Like, just talk. You know, yeah. like, don't write it. Just people have done it a million times. Stand up there and talk. It's very easy just to stand up there and talk. So when I became, when I did that, it got much better. But late in the season, like December, my boss calls me and he's like, you know, I think we'd like to make you our insider. We didn't have one at that point after Jason Lock and Porter got fired. Uh, or not renewed, I should say. Um, and like, we'd like to make our insider. We'd like you to come to LA for, uh, for Black Monday, which is what we called it at the time when the coaches get fired at the end of the season. <laughs> yep. We haven't broken one in three years. We'd like you to try to break one. I was like, okay. Awesome. So I went to, I did a lot of work. I went to LA. I broke the Bears firing Levy Smith, mm. uh, which was a huge story at the time. And I was like, okay, like maybe I could do this. And then, you know, basically like a couple months later, they named me our insider and that's, you know, moved to New York after I signed a new deal a couple years after that. But basically after that, it was like everything I did, like I went on the road for Thursday night football just to meet people for two years. Everything I did was about getting contacts around the league and like doing this job. Ian, one, yeah. one quick question at that time. Where, where, where was the NFL Network as far as ratings and sort of brand versus ESPN? Where, is any context of the timeline from when you were there and where it is today? And, yeah. Um, you know, I'm, I know that we didn't, at the time, we didn't break a lot of news. Now we break a lot of news. Yeah. At the time we didn't. Ratings, I'm not sure. I mean, okay. I, I know. But it's for, grown. It's grown. And I know for Sunday morning, we've closed the gap pretty good. I mean, we're in a really good place ratings wise, it seems. Um, and I know from news, from a news standpoint, we, we definitely more than hold our own. Now, when you became the insider, did you have to move to LA or did you stay in Dallas? They talked about moving me to LA. I did not want to at all. Yeah. Um, I didn't want to wake up at four in the morning every day and frantically check my phone just because of the time difference. Uh -huh. Yeah. So it was either move to LA and be in studio for game day morning, our pregame show, or move to New York and do it from 345 Park, the NFL office in New York City. So I chose to move to New York. So I finally got to go back to New York, which I wanted to go to. And this whole this whole cycle. What year? What year? Give us yeah. Give us a timeline. Where, where so we, we moved? Um, we moved to New York in 2013, I think. Wait, is that okay. right? No. No, no, no. It must have been no. 2015, we moved to New York. And Ian, are you, are you engaged, married? Kid, where, where are you in your cycle of your family as well at this stage? Um, so when we moved, when we moved to, both our boys were born, uh, we, we got married in Birmingham um, right before I uh, took the job covering the Patriots. When we moved to New York, we had two kids. We still have two kids. We had two small kids, both born in Dallas. Jude was like five or six months and Max was about two. Mm -hmm. So okay. that was like four and a half years ago, basically. Right. Okay. Wow. Okay. So now, yeah, now we're going to get kind of caught up in real time. Couple, you know, uh, kind of final questions, but before we, uh, before we, uh, we wrap, um, mm. uh, wrap the show, you like that. Um, so um, now you're, you've cut, you've come back to New York. Where, where and how did, when did you actually move out of the city, out of the city? into where you live now and, and, and sort of this, this setup and talk to us a little bit about what you got going behind you. Yeah, well, we, um, you know, we, we moved to basically the suburbs, like right off the bat. We just lived in a rental house and now a permanent house. But the, the thought was always, you know, move to Westchester and drive into the city every Sunday for game day morning. And, you know, they put a studio in my house, which, you know, everyone's always like, oh, it's so great. And it is great, believe me. But it also means you can be on air at literally any moment. Yeah. So my life yeah, is just yeah. different because, you know, I could be like in a swimming pool or something. It's like, hey, can you get on air? So, um, but still I can, you know, they put the studio behind me. It's awesome. We're on air like, you know, 10 times a day from here. And it's kind of been like that for the last five years. Right. <laughs> um, and, um, and, and I know, Ian, we were, uh, we were in the last couple of weeks, I wanted to get any uh, – any insights of shifting gears on the on 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 our shared experience and love for the Kentucky Derby? 
Um, it's we, we, we miss it this year, back next year maybe, no? Uh, I mean, we, we're set to go in September. Hopefully it's on with fans, we'll see. Yep. Um, the following year, I'm really bummed right now because it is currently scheduled for the last day of the draft and I'll be in Cleveland. So I'm, you know, working on the Kentucky Derby officials to move the race for me, but I don't know if that's <laughs> going to happen. So I'm looking at the prospect of hopefully we go this year, but missing next year. Uh, and I will be extremely beyond bummed about that. Definitely my, definitely one of the things I most look forward to all year. I'll say that. Bill, you've heard me say this for years. You gotta, you gotta join, uh, you gotta join on one of these trips, man. It's one of the best. You know, I, I acquired a company um, in Louisville, and, uh, and after we acquired the business, um, you know, around April, I get a note from one of the senior guys there, and they say, hey, what do you want to do with the tickets? And I go, tickets for what? And he goes, oh, um, you know, the company has longstanding tickets to the Kentucky Derby um, every year. Um, you know, all the practice rounds and, you know, pre ones, and then the actual Derby. Um, the problem is it, it, my, my daughter's birthday is Cinco de Mayo and it always falls like, on her birthday weekend. So I've been, I've owned this company for like 10 years and I've never been able to go. So how old is your actually, daughter? Uh, well now she, so actually her birthday was, was two days ago. Uh, and she just turned 15. Okay. Probably a decent age to go to the Kentucky Derby. It, it, <laughs> yeah. Well, now it's moved. So now maybe I can actually go. That's right. Yeah. There you no. go. So now it's, it's, this is maybe the I'll silver linings. Um, so listen, this has been, this has been incredible, right? Um, you know, just kind of getting to know your history, your path. Um, you know, I think we can all agree your, your wife seems to be your superpower because she, <laughs> you know, told you to take jobs and, you know, followed you wherever you went and, you know, put your career first. Um, and I think we can probably say that about almost everyone's, every successful person, you know, has a support yep. system behind them, but we're not going to, we're not going to let it off that easy. Um, Chris, would you like me to start off and then you Bill, add let's, in? Let, 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 let's stay consistent, my man. Get, give us uh, let Ian, Ian hear it and I'll, I'll give, uh, I'll give my uh, take as well. So, so just, and, and so Ian, I kind of just think out loud, you know, throw some things out there and then I give Chris time to actually come up with something intelligent. <laughs> um, so, um, so listen, I, I think, you know, in this day and age, you know, where you have access to millions of people, either through Twitter or social media or now TikTok, you know, um, you know, see people think it's so easy to kind of create a following. Um, and the reality of it is it's not right. And so, you know, it's not like Ian, you know, has millions of followers, you know, just, you know, just because he works at the NFL. It's like, you have, you have practiced this craft over a long period of time, right? So success just doesn't happen. And people may say, hey, Ian's an overnight success. And almost everyone who gets characterized as an overnight success, it took him like 20 years to get there. Uh -huh. um, what I would say is, you know, um, you followed your passion, not necessarily the dollars, right? You got into this business knowing that it paid nothing. Um, and you know, there was no Twitter back then. There was no kind of breaking news back then. Even cable, you know, wasn't even as strong as it is today. Um, you know, so you got into this business because it was a passion. Um, and what I would say is, you know, sports, I, you know, going into this, I thought, hey, you just were this like kid who loved sports and, you know, love sports wasn't the sports was the secondary passion. The primary passion was actually uh, publishing and reporting, right? And writing. And, you know, and, and you practice your craft. You got really lucky in that you practice your craft with the best of the best, right? The best follow yeah. college football coach followed by the best professional NFL coach. Um, but I think it's actually that kind of like, you know, just passion around, you know, that craft, um, you know, which, you know, it's, it's all about time and place. And I said it before, you know, bet on the jockey, not the horse, um, you know, and, you know, you also benefited by the fact that technology advancements um, has, you know, right, risen to the point where you have a studio in your basement, you can break stuff, you know, you know, you can be on TV in a minute's notice, um, you can break stuff on social media, 
But, um, but I, what I would say is, you know, it was that you just, you just had like something inside you that was just like, Hey, I'm going to do this and I'm going to be happy doing it. And I could be paid $30,000 in Mississippi and feel like I'm the king of the world. Um, and so you weren't driven by money. You were driven by that passion. And that passion was around reporting. It's not around sports. Um, so, sports would be the secondary piece of it. So I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, thanks, Bill. I'm going to follow on to that. Obviously touch on the fact that you were early, early centered around technology uh, and adopting technology and blogs. I, a lot of things I picked up Ian on this conversation, high level of EQ, IQ, social awareness, social intelligence. I think, um, your interactions with coaches, your, the charity experience with Bill Belichick, knowing kind of when to say what and how to say it. Um, so I think that's, that's definitely a layer of the superpower conversation, but I'm going to kind of try to sit. It's always really hard to synthesize um, what, what it is. I, I'm going to go with a, um, I, I love Bill's summary. I'm also going to add a high degree of pattern recognition. Yes. I, think, I think if I had to really try to distill and again, there's a lot of them, so don't, get, don't, don't be offended if, if, you're, if you don't love it. But I think pattern recognition, all the data, all the inputs, all the experiences, conversations, locker room, all those different things, your, your superpower is your ability to see, uh, take advantage of pattern recognition, and as a result of that, tell good stories. The, the other thing I picked up, the other <laughs> thing, I, the I, like other thing I picked up is you, you have this uncanny ability to remember every single person's name. Like you recalled from, you know, 20 years ago, someone who you were interviewing against, like, you know, uh, I, I cannot remember names. It's like my worst thing. So I, I like, I like, you know, I like the EQ part of this, like the pattern recognition and EQ, but also following that passion. Um, and I tell, I tell young people all the time, like your goal is not to like figure out, Hey, how can I make the most money? How can I do it? It's to find your passion in life. And if you find your passion, you're truly passionate about it, riches will come maybe. And the riches may come monetarily or it could be, you know, come in that you just, you know, you are at peace with life and you love life and you love what you do. Um, but it seems like you have a 360 view there where you have not, you know, you have that EQ, um, you're in the right place at the right time, but you followed your passion and then you have people that support your passion. Um, and Leah, who now I can't wait to have on the podcast. <laughs> so, so Ian, we, 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 built, we built you up. You're going to feel really good about yourself as we let you uh, go on your day. I do want to add one final thing before we let you go, and thank you. Um, outside of the professional side, the, I think talking about the father side and being a great dad and a great husband, I've had a, a little, you know, some time to be able to experience that. Um, I think that's a, a huge component of the family of life. So I want to compliment you on that and obviously well, the, great, the great work you're doing and we're gonna we're gonna stop um we're gonna let you respond to text messages yeah. and, and get <laughs> back to, like, to breaking news ian thank you for all the time you gave us and, and join in superpowers podcast man awesome it was a blast it was it was everything i hoped it would be and thank you for the the synthesis of my superpowers it's been great guys thanks so much awesome thanks, ian. thank you ian superpowers 